Okay, um, so I am Rav Kamukwadi, as Benji said. Um, so one advantage I have is I don't know anything at all about material science. Um, I did do electrical engineering as an undergraduate. So the last material science course I've taken is about 37 years old. Um, so unlike uh, Carla who had to say, don't ask me tough questions about material science, I say, ask me, it doesn't matter. I would not understand what you're asking. <laughs> Okay, um, what I'm trying to do, however, is I did see uh, the nice video that Benji made uh, sort of uh, introducing this session. And so when they asked me to come and give this talk, I said, did you get the right person? Um, you know, I understand I'm here, but you know, do you want me to say anything? And, and they did think that some of the things that I thought I could tell you about might be potentially useful to you. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you sort of generally about why is AI suddenly very much in the, in, you know, in the public eye and also what possible uh, changes that might have uh, you know, uh, many of the engineering disciplines, including, I believe, material science. Um, so as I said, uh, yeah, that was my uh, bachelor's thesis. That's uh, I done before the invention of laser printers. For those of you, that's how we used to make our thesis. Um, and then, of course, for most of my time in AI, people used to kind of wince and feel sorry for me when I tell them that I work in artificial intelligence. And obviously, you don't have better things to do in your life. Clearly, uh, they are nowhere to be found now because you know AI is all over the place. This is the latest uh, uh, economist had uh, this article about the number of companies that are mentioning artificial intelligence in their earnings reports, and you can see that between 2007 and 2018, it's gone you know essentially exponential. I guess you could also write a, a curve like this: uh, number of engineering disciplines who want to use AI, and that too is increasing exponentially. Um, and then, so there's a, a significant amount of hype involved. I mean, you know, has been, AI has been um, um, compared to electricity bigger than fire and electricity. AI sometimes apparently is considered God. Um, I personally, I personally would like to get that particular car. Uh, 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 vanity plate AI hype because that's pretty much what's going on to some extent. Um, uh, I'm not completely complaining, you know, because when do I get to be on the TV shows if AI was not in the you know public consciousness? Um, so what I want to do, however, is tell you a little about what just happened. Why is it that you know, despite what may you may have heard of, AI didn't start in 2012. It started actually unlike other areas. We actually have a specific date in which AI started in 1956. There was this meeting in uh, in Dartmouth where um, John McCarthy gave the area uh, the name artificial intelligence. Uh, so why is it that suddenly everybody is talking about this? Uh, and I want to provide you a perspective. You know, parts of it I guess kind of came through in in Carla's talk, but I want to give you a slightly more elaborate perspective on that. And then also talk about are we done? Uh, given the whatever new advances happened, and in particular, I want to talk a little about human aware AI systems because in fact one of the things that I saw in Benji's uh, uh, YouTube video which by the way I watched so 731 has become 732 now uh, of the viewers uh, is that in fact you want to have human material scientist jobs right because if everything is being done by AI what will you guys do um, and then so there is that requires AI systems to collaborate with humans and that turns out actually to be harder than you might expect and so I in fact gave my presidential address uh, at AAAI this year on the challenges of human aware artificial intelligence that's the whole entire talk but I'll at least touch on some of the points of that. Okay. So this is how we start talking about AI basically AI is the design of intelligent agents it's not about learning it's not about reasoning it is about an agent just like yourself which can look at the world, understand what's going on, sense the world, use the background knowledge to decide what to do in the world next. Okay, uh, so this is basically how where you start. And of course, in, in terms of understanding what happened in AI, I find that this is a very useful uh, metaphor to have in mind. If you think of little kids coming into this world and start showing various signs of intelligence, I know that there are parents here who think that their kids who are 35 years old are not showing any signs of intelligence, but be that as it may, you know, we tend to think that kids show perceptual and manipulation intelligence. They can recognize their parents' faces. They can start nicely, you know, um, manipulating blocks and stuff. Then they show some amount of emotional intelligence. Then they show social intelligence. And then finally, only when they go to class, you know, school and start doing various SATs, etc., they start showing some signs of uh, uh, cognitive intelligence. Okay, keep this in mind. Now, the last time actually AI was this big and people were talking about it and they asked people like us to come and give talks was in 1980s when there was experts 
systems craze where essentially the that time the mantra was material science people will just write down all the rules that they use to come up with uh, you know designing experiments or figuring out what new materials to invent and then we'll write all these rules in a big database and have a nice reasoning system that was the expert system and then the humans don't have to do that grunt work and that was you know almost as big a bubble at that particular time uh, then in 90s you have a reasoning system that for example the chess deep blue dethroned kasparov um, and then now the interesting thing is as uh, sort of came out earlier too that uh, when deep, deep blue won over kasparov it basically could see multiple moves ahead which is an amazing sign of intellect and intelligence but it couldn't understand what a particular piece looks like it doesn't actually can it cannot actually it doesn't have a perceptual ability uh, what changed of course in recent years was the perceptual reasoning tasks and uh, in particular we can do speech and images and of course that's why you, all of you have your cell phones and you can take pictures and then ask what is in the picture and currently one of the biggest things is really connecting the reasoning and the perceptual tasks is what we need to be uh, looking at um, now if you look at this actually i said the, the the kids went from perceptual towards cognitive reasoning and ai went the opposite way went from cognitive intelligence to perceptual intelligence that sounds interesting why is it that that happened i would actually say that if there's nothing else you remember remember this slide um, it actually explains a whole lot of how ai works in particular the reason ai developed this way is we originally programmed computers and we can only program things that we understand we have conscious theories of we do have conscious theories of a lot of things how to play chess how to do you know reasoning in various areas etc but we have bogus theories of how to see the world we don't actually understand how we see the world or how we hear the world uh, so when it came to perception the only thing that you had to do is to wait until the machine learning systems became effective enough uh, for large amounts of with large amounts of data for example even kids human kids essentially spend a lot of time sitting there and being cute and absorbing a large amount of imagery and voice and then they're slowly figuring out patterns if you ask them what exactly in this picture makes it a cat nobody knows how to write a rule this was something that we don't have and in fact this whole idea of Polanyi there which I mentioned earlier Polanyi's paradox Polanyi is this amateur philosopher who pointed out that we know a lot more than we can articulate articulation is the ability to declaratively say that you know something you know to how to recognize benji but if you ask you know can you write a bunch of rules you probably have no idea how to write that okay but on the other hand you know how to play chess but you can write rules for that both of them are important it's important to understand that we know uh, things consciously as well as subconsciously what happened of course was originally conscious uh, tasks were being automated now we also can automate subconscious tasks um, now of course why did AI catch public imagination right now essentially because perception winds up being very important if everybody in the uh, world has to be able to use AI right for example you now can have systems listening to you systems seeing things and suddenly it's not just an you know sort of an academic exercise or of IBM deep blue winning one particular game it's everybody is seeing this happening now it also means then that people are jumping to conclusions left and right which is why if you make the mistake of asking google or somebody to tell me what is the news items on ai you won't get any other work done because every day there's just so much news items most of which are possibly not even well connected to the reality uh, so of course a lot of the perceptual inform uh, advances came from the neural networks as um, um, and, and in particular for the image uh, processing aspects a particular version of image uh, uh, neural networks called convolutional nets which wind up doing parameter sharing wound up being very useful um, the bigger thing of course is as Carla also pointed out these ideas have been around from 1960s 62 Persatran was uh, done at the time I was born apparently uh, and then basically only in 2012 these things started becoming big in particular in the old times even though the theory was there it was extremely hard to train networks that are that have too many units right now when you have something like a image recognition system it has something like 13 million parameters 13 million weights that are being learned automatically and that requires both a large amount of data and large amount of training and that's what wound up changing 
Uh, so in particular, uh, by the way, I want to just mention this that uh, so one of the cute things that we can also do you know, connected to a related version of uh, neural networks is we can also imagine images just like you have dreams you know machines can imagine images that actually leads to all sorts of interesting things so if you don't want to pay hollywood actors much money then you can make new hollywood actors apparently some of them are real ones some of them are imaginary ones i can't tell myself them myself yourself okay so why is this third time of uh, neural networks become such a useful thing? Why did it actually work this time? And you know, people tend to think it's because of computation. And some other people in, from neural networks would like to believe it is because of theory. Okay, so it turns out that there are theoretical advantages that side, and some advances just because the society changed. We started having internet, we started having cell phones, we started taking pictures of every possible cat in the world and started putting it up on the internet. And that meant a large amount of data. Just to put this in perspective, old image processing and computer vision used to have one picture called Lena's picture, which was a farmer playboy model and that they cut it into piece and then they would use that to train and test mostly. Now the image net that's of, I think 2012 timeframe had million images. Now it has 14 million images. And places like Google, you know, basically train their image, uh, their machines, uh, their networks with billions of images. It's this data that was the most important thing. It was just the technology was there. In fact, just to put this in perspective, a uh, couple of years back, right here in this convention center, it turns out Jeff Hinton gave a talk uh, at AAAI. And uh, he showed this slide and then so their great theoretical advances, their great uh, practical advances, what really was reason why things happened? It turns out the theoretical advances, even by himself, his own reckoning, is about 100x speed up. And the fact that we have data available and the compute was feasible was the reason for the other 1000x. That was two years back. In AI these days, two years is an eternity. So you can understand how the changes were happening. So that's sort of an agenda, that's the part about a perspective on what changed and why, what changed was we were able to do conscious tasks and automate them. Now we can also do unconscious tasks and then we can learn how to do them. Now I want to spend the rest of my talk talking about are we done and what are the interesting um, pendulum swings that happen intellectually because now people think that the only thing that's worth doing is unconscious tasks, not conscious tasks. Okay, um, so first thing actually is data versus doctrine intention. So that, by the way, is Polanyi. I found a rare photograph of him somewhere. Uh, and he's the guy who said, uh, conscious, uh, we know a lot more than we can uh, articulate. But then it's also true that we know a lot more that we can articulate. And both are important. Okay, however, what happened right now is you hear AI, people assume the only thing that's relevant is learning from data, learning patterns from data. And that can lead to a lots of uh, uh, interesting paradoxes. So for example, if you join a company, they have a bunch of rules and they would like to give you the doctrine saying this is the way you are supposed to behave in this company. Or if you know how to do a particular experiment, there is a set of uh, doctrine uh, for that. You would like the system to be able to use that. Instead, you, if you have to learn, then you have to show huge numbers of examples and learn what you know by the system itself. So that winds up being sort of an ironic way to do things. So AI pendulum sort of swung from all rules have exceptions. You start with rules and the rules have exceptions to what do you mean rules, okay? Uh, and then this to some extent also led to the outsiders thinking all we need is a large amount of data and certain amount of GPUs and magic will happen. And that, unfortunately, is not actually quite true. Um, one of the other interesting things is a lot of work in the reasoning aspect, the cognitive intelligence aspect, went essentially conscious with conscious theories. So we tend to write our conscious theories in logical formalisms, probabilistic logic, or first order logic, and so on. The things that are learned, on the other hand, are currently at least they're mostly like this neural network formalisms, which essentially are sort of inscrutable because we can't actually understand what the machine learned. Okay. Now it turns out that. To combine both the conscious and unconscious tasks, you need to find, you need to get the reasoning guys to come towards more correlational models and correlational guys 
to use more causal models and that actually slides from some of our work that's pretty much one of the things a few things that i'll show about our work where i work in planning and we wind up doing plan planning models from data where they're not necessarily causal but they can be learned more easily and then using that to decide how to do reasoning now another thing that people may have heard about is this whole issue of interpretability bugaboo which is ai does something we can't explain what's going on now this was never a problem if you told ai the theory of how to do chess if a chess machine makes a move that's wrong you can explain why it went wrong if on the other hand if it learned all the patterns just from the data and if in fact there is nothing hand no hand feet hand coded features are provided to the machine then it's not surprising at all that what it does is not understood by you so in fact wittgenstein once said that if a lion could speak we could not understand him conversation is not just english conversation is shared vocabulary okay and so if you don't have shared vocabulary the explanations become a big issue so for example some of you may have seen this on the left hand side is a school bus and i added some imperceptible noise to it on the right hand side i got the noisy image and all of you can see that noisy image is a an ostrich right okay it turns out most image recognition algorithms will see that and say it's an ostrich okay and similarly that's a dog with some some noise added and the other one is an ostrich again okay now you are wondering now you know when it said a school bus was a school bus you felt very happy when it said something which looked extremely like a school bus is an ostrich you are very worried the problem is when the representations are not understood the failure modes are inscrutable you celebrate when it is right and when it is wrong you are screwed you have no idea what happened okay um so in fact for me it's the most un uh, unfortunate thing on this is apparently that says south indian temple you add a little bit of noise that too becomes ostriches so now it is possible that the world is full of ostriches and we just no don't notice it okay <laughs> now it is also true that just before you pat your own backs thinking how come um, we are human we know how to do things how many of you have seen this picture this yeah see at least some people actually read news um so this was a picture from you know taken from the country that's our favorite immigration country norway um where essentially they saw this picture somebody posted this and they said oh my god norway is being taken over by burqa clad muslim women we need to stop this immigration okay now you can feel sorry for their narrow mindedness but you can understand why they may have thought that picture actually looks like burqa clad women so we have visual fallacies but we understand when the failure occurs on the other hand i don't know if you could ever at all see that the second school bus was an ostrich how many ever times i tell you that is an ostrich now the other reason for this is when we are doing this high dimensional uh, training for you know in this image uh, recognition and so on we tend to think that the what the system is doing is that it has in this high dimensional space some nice contiguous you know convex regions one is for chimp one is for gibbon one is for panda and so on so you see something which looks little more like panda i will say it's panda this is what your mental image is but it could very well be that what's happening is more like this what the machine did is it learned small slithers in this high dimensional space and said that is a dog that's a chimp that's a gibbon and the rest of the images are mostly in the rest of the space in the high dimensional space at that point it's passing a coin and when they're passing a coin then you do get worried as to why things are actually not what you were expecting so that's what we're keeping in mind when you understand that you know the patterns that are being learned when you don't have the uh, shared vocabulary you could have all sorts of interesting questions as to how to make them understandable to to uh, their failure more understandable to humans um the last part that i want to do uh, i think i have like 10 minutes total right? yeah. 10 minutes yeah that's good so the thresholds to so what else is left to be done so i already mentioned this very important point that we need to be able to combine the combine learned representations with representations where we can provide knowledge to the machine because we despite what you might think we actually have knowledge and so we should be able to tell machines what we want so in fact one of the earliest uh, goals of ai was this advice taker program by mccarthy who actually gave the name ai to ai and he said i want to be able to tell my machine what to do and that's the way we tell each other 
and you should be able to operationalize that knowledge. And that's a big uh, challenge. Of course, you know, uh, other challenges include common sense, you know, uh, Carla Gomes, uh, Carla mentioned that. My own favorite example for common sense is this, um, Explorer Magellan went around the world three times. One of his trips he died. Which trip did he die in? It's not a material science research question, but if you don't understand the answer to this, you're in trouble, right? Most machines will not be able to answer this. Uh, in, in not just that, but that sort of common sense glue we don't have yet. Uh, the ability to reason with incomplete models, sample efficient learning. One of the things that we can do right now is if you have tons and tons and tons of data, then you can hopefully find patterns. But normally what we do is we understand a whole bunch of, you know, we, we have some background knowledge and somebody shows a one picture and says, we will call this kind of a thing, um, you know, horse giraffe. For example, then you now know the new concept called Hars Giraffe, which basically just based on one that example. So that sample efficient learning winds up being very important, especially in the kinds of places where you want humans and machines to work together. It's actually completely fine if machines take over and we just go sit somewhere else. Okay, then they have their language. We don't need to understand that at all. Okay, but if on the other hand you want to work with machines, then you need to have common vocabulary. And then that brings me to the interaction with machines, which is the other one that uh, closer to my heart, and I'll end with that. So AI had a somewhat of a curious ambivalence to humans. Um, we are in the news whenever we are very far away from everybody on Mars, uh, which is like uh, Spirit and Rover, or when we basically cream one more human champion in one more well-known game. Okay, um, so basically, it's as if we want to help humanity, it's the people we really can't stand. You know, we don't seem to be working with them. Um, interesting reasons why that has happened, I don't want, I can't go into that right now. There's a longer talk. It sort of shows that there was this worry in the beginnings of the field that if you put humans in the loop, humans will solve the problem and machines won't have anything to do. In fact, the original mechanical talk, the one that Amazon uses, uh, it was came from Turkey in the old days where they would take this contraption which has a little person sitting in and who would be doing all the work and then people will think it's a computer. So there was this worry that you might be cheating. But actually having humans and interacting with humans whether you like it or not is a much harder problem and it's the higher sign of our intelligence than your ability to play Go or chess. We do it so effortlessly that we take it for granted. But imagine if you don't know how to interact with humans. I know I'm talking to a whole bunch of engineers, myself being one. We think it's not really that needed. We can get along, we get good salaries. But in general, we do have to work with humans. And in the, you know, in this picture, I, for example, showed you that this is the agent looking at the environment. Where are the other agents? Supposedly, they are in the environment. So as if, if there are humans, they too are part of this inanimate environment. If you want to take humans into consideration, the first thing you need to do is to be able to model their mental state. What I'm saying, how is that modifying their mental state? What are they trying to do? And how do I take that into account in showing my behavior that makes sense to them? And that actually changes quite significantly the entire architecture of the intelligent agent. Um, so that's what I gave a talk um, two months back in, in February on challenges of human AI systems that's available on the uh, web. But I just want to show a couple of points and then end. Um, for example, if you, there's this whole interesting -ish thing that you know came up in your uh, YouTube video as well as other people hoping that somehow computers and us will work together. Oftentimes when we work with computers, we enter the land of computers. They don't enter our land. We enter their land. We basically, that's why we get paid hardship allowance because we have to deal with the computers. One of the hopes of AI is the AI agents will enter our land. They can understand our language, they can understand our sites, they can also understand our mental models and use that in deciding you know, how to collaborate with us. And that's like a, a really big important goal of AI. Uh, so for example, teaming requires modeling the human um, that can be done by intention recognition. What are they trying to do? And also, if you are trying to do something, provide an intention projection. Tell the human what you are trying to do. One of the biggest things that is an issue in self-driving cars is we tend to make eye contact with a human when they stop at the intersection and say, you are not going to run me over, right? And then they say, ah, okay, and then you cross. 
Right now, you're looking at this silly car and you try to hope for the best, okay? So this is where the car, like in those uh, movies, has to say, yeah, I see you. And that's an intentional projection, for example. And we can do technologies to support that. Uh, that's some of the projects. On my lab and the second one is teaming also requires the humans model of you it's a second level information so the humans themselves have a model of the artificial agent the AI agent and using that they decide whether the AI agents behavior is understandable explicable or not so for example right now if I stand up on this uh, table and jump down it's a reasonable behavior but I think most of you will be surprised because you didn't have this as part of what I'm supposed to be doing right now Okay, so even though I feel like jumping, I contain myself and keep talking to you. So I'm showing explicable behavior so that it would be easy for you, for you to understand my behavior. Now imagine a huge big bee has, has come here and is trying to bite me. At this point, trying to stand in place is going to be pretty hard for me. So I would like to jump up and down. At that point, I will start jumping up and down and then start giving you at the top of my voice. You know, I'm doing this because a bee is biting me. That's explanation. There's a lot of interest in explainability in AI. Explanations are not soliloquy. It's not you talking to yourself. It's ta you talking to the other person in terms of their model of what your capabilities are. And so that's another thing that we do. So in fact, we can do this in the context of humans and robots collaborating. And that one is much more humans and a software artifact together doing a particular kind of planning um, exercise. Okay. Um, so I'm going to end, I believe, on time. Um, in summary, having made most progress on declarative tasks, AI systems in the recent years have also found significant success in learning tacit knowledge from data. And then this has, of course, had some interesting intellectual ramifications because now it's the pendulum has swung to the other side that I don't want anybody to tell me anything. Just show me the data and I'll hopefully find the pattern. That actually makes no sense. Nobody seriously in AI believes that learning from tons and tons of data is the only way to go. Um, and so you need to combine these higher level reasoning tasks with the learned representations. And that might involve going, getting both of them to a middle ground. Uh, so that's very important thing to understand. Combining declarative advice with automatically learned models remains an important challenge. And then, of course, I ended by saying that having AI systems work collaboratively with humans poses a variety of important challenges. It's people just seem to think that, oh, it's very easy, the machine does something, I'll do something. Most of the time, that can actually increase your mental cognitive overload because you're trying to enter the land of the machines. We're in 21st century, it's time machines entered our land. Okay, so that's what we should be doing as research. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have questions. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you. Uh, great talk, thank you. I wanted to talk to you about the black box nature of deep learning. As mm -hmm. scientists and engineers, uh, we're always curious as to why certain decision was made. We want to open up the lid and understand why he spit it out the, the prediction or the, the result that is pretty out. So. Can you elaborate on your So there are, so again, this is the issue of who is trying to understand, okay? The ex explanation is not a one size fits all. There could be a Google engineer who are Uber engineer who wants to understand why did uh, that, that pedestrian not less than about six miles from here, not more than five, six miles from here, why did it look like nothing at all and the car didn't even break? So that's Uber engineers are going to do that. Okay, but even if they do that, they might, for example, find that in the following 15th layer and in the 17th layer, the activations were wrong. If you go tell that to that woman's family, that's not going to be useful. Even more importantly, the driver of the car doesn't understand 
at all the level of this particular kind of decision making. So you need to provide a, so for example, doctors come up with a diagnosis, they will provide a, an explanation as to why they came up with the diagnosis to you, the patient, and then in a very different way to the other doctors. It's because they are essentially customizing their explanations. Right now, all we can do to in the beginning stages at now is that basically you can get through this large scale network, try to visualize what's happening at various levels and figure out why it reached this wrong decision. And it turns out that's basically only for debugging purposes for the system designer. That's the least of our problems. If in fact AI technology is to be used by lay people, which is exactly what our hope is, right? Because just as I am a lay person from the material size point of view, material scientists are likely to be lay persons from the AI point of view. And for them to have to go and understand what's going on in the program every three seconds is not really making their life easy. So we can only do that first part right now. We don't really, even that very, um, you know, imperfectly. Thank you. Chris, you have a question in the back? Um, so, in material science, we ultimately have physics, which you can interpret as this common vocabulary, which you think you know, is something that we need. Mm -hmm. You can also think of it as rules for an expert system. Mm -hmm. for this, you know, and you said expert system, which supposed to bubble that to open the haters. So, do you think it is a fruitful endeavor to try to teach um, AI to? learn and understand physics? So first of all, yes, and there are works done. So for example, one of the things that people try to do right now is to try and have machines learn naive physics models by watching a huge number of YouTube videos. I don't know whether that's the best way to learn about physics, but there is that possibility right now. Okay. But secondly, the other interesting question is the pendulum swing. In fact, this is the thing. Engineers think models are reasonable. We have models and we'll combine that with learned knowledge, which is the right way to look at it. But more people who sort of are in the AI bandwagon because they read in the public press, basically tend to think, what models? Why do you need any models whatsoever? Let the machine learn everything. Okay. Um, that is a crazy idea. Two in two different ways. One, because if they do learn, then what we have nothing to play with them for because they'll just do everything. And secondly, if, until they get to the point where they learn all of physics, you have no real way of providing additional physical knowledge to the machine. So in fact, right now, if you are into just neural networks, the physical knowledge, obviously, we find it most natural to provide it in terms of differential equations, for example, right? Neural networks are much better off in understanding different architectures. So you need to transfer Newton's physics into neural network architectures. So for example, convolutional nets, to the extent they have any background knowledge, all they are saying essentially is the regions of the image can be processed with the same set of parameters. So went from spatial proximity to this particular architecture. You need to find those kinds of architectures that will make sense for physics. People are trying that, but you could also try to actually say, why can't the machine take advice at a physics level. Okay. Great. Eric? Just because just it follows along those lines, it, is there a, another way of thinking that says, how can, how can you take uh, data and relationships between data to point to where physics should be looked for? Mm -hmm. do, do you understand what I mean by that? In, in that uh, we are, you know, as, as physicists or chemists, we're looking to understand the, the mechanisms, the origins of phenomena. And the difficulty can be that we have to run experiments based on our own intuition, uh, our reading of the literature and the like. And I, I think there's there's maybe some advantages to, to taking it. Did the output from these things mathematically or some other way to help us know where to look? Yeah, so, so partly right now there are two different ways. As I said, one is, of course, you provide a physics-based simulator. Then I will run that simulator and then I can use reinforcement learning to slowly figure out what is there in the simulator in a format that gets translated into the neural network architecture to some extent. That is possible. But then you already did the heavy lifting, which is you provided a full physics-based simulator already. Okay. Uh, the other aspect is basically try to learn physics without talking to you. 
which is, you know, this is old Binky Barnes thing in Arthur that all I wanted to learn about the world, I just learned it from the TV. So now you can learn it from YouTube, okay? And then unfortunately, YouTube has these magical videos of people jumping off and nothing happening. And your junior system might actually think that might be a reasonable way of doing physics too. And then we are in big trouble, okay? <laughs> Last question. I think we're good. Great, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for talking very much. And so we'll be on break until 3.30 while we set up uh, for the panel discussion. So please come back. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Hi. 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 Thanks. Um, could I get a signature for you for this? Oh. Just, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, let me just save this. Yeah. Sure, sure. Oh, I need to do this. Uh,